There might be some showing up. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Ashok Begara Kavan. I hope I pronounce your name correctly half, halfway. I was 18 before I could figure out how to pronounce that. So <laughs> <laughs> it's an assistant professor um, at Rice University. He got his PhD from University of Maryland and he is interested in computational imaging. That's what he is going to talk about, computational imaging beyond the limits imposed by lenses. Um, we have a project that, or he has a project and we have a project that is sort of uh, related. And I think he will learn about his research in the talk um, in the next 45 minutes or so. Ashok, it's your thing. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Maybe I just, I'm just going to maybe stand and talk because it makes it much more, at least I'm used to standing and talking rather than sitting. So, <laughs> okay. Let me share screen, uh, share the slides and then. Can you see the screen? Yes. OK. So as uh, thanks, thanks, everyone, for inviting me. And thanks for being here uh, for the talk. What I'm going to try to talk about today is uh, computational imaging beyond the limits imposed by lenses. Before I go on, is the, is the volume clear? Am I speaking too fast, too slow? It's good. OK. And uh, I have a tendency to uh, accelerate my pace of speaking as I go forward. So I would really appreciate it if one of you just stop me when I speak too fast and I start running rather than walking. OK? We slow you down. OK, thank you. OK. Most of the work that I'm going to talk about here today is collaborative work with uh, Richard Barnick at Rice, Ashwin Sankaran Arayanan at uh, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Jacob Robinson at Rice and uh, Oliver Cossart at Northwestern University. Um, so before I go on to the meet, technical meat of uh, the talk, I thought I'd give you a brief background of what my lab does, what kind of research projects we're involved in, what are the challenges that interest us. Uh, so, uh, so if you look at the left-hand side, what you notice is that uh, my lab uh, works in this intersection of coded illumination. So. Uh, illu uh, novel illumination devices, generalized optics, and signal processing algorithms. So the question we more often than not ask is the question of can co-design of optics, sensors, illumination, and algorithms lead to performance enhancements, flexibility in terms of imaging, and so on and so forth. So we're mostly interested in devices and systems where we can design, co-design illumination, optics, uh, sensing algorithms and sensors. Uh, while that's the broad umbrella of our uh, research group, there are three uh, big areas or research thrusts in my group. And I'll describe each of these three research thrusts and I'll go from the bottom to the top simply because we're going to talk mostly about the top and the rest of the talk. Um, so one of the projects that we're very active in is uh, computational and in vivo microscopy. So here the idea so what's the grand challenge here? The grand challenge is that microscopes today are heavy, much, much heavier and bulkier than the objects they are taking an image of. I'm showing you an example of an image here where you're trying to understand how a rat or a mouse thinks while it's navigating a maze. Now, if you wanted to understand how a rat thinks, uh, while it's navigating a maze, that's a hard problem. It is. It goes to the gut of uh, how we as humans m might think. And so it's a very interesting problem to understand from a neuroscience point of view. But to do this, you need three things. You need a microscope that can record neural activity, synaptic firings, while the mouse is unrestrained and free to move about. Now, that's a very hard problem. If you think about the traditional microscopes that are available today, most of those traditional microscopes are much heavier than the mice itself, which basically means that the only experiments that can be conducted as on data are experiments one of twofold. And that's what you see all around. In experiment number one, you just give up the goal of imaging the brain at all. And you say, I'm just going to make inferences based upon 
behavioral outcomes that the mouse takes. So you let the mouse run in a, uh, in a maze, you just observe the behavior of the mouse rather than understanding anything about the neural synaptic firings and so on. The other solution is to put in a mouse on a treadmill, restrain it completely, fix its skull, image the brain while the mouse is not freely moving about, but rather is moving about perhaps on a treadmill, just being able to, so it's a very artificial circumstance. What we are after is trying to see whether we can develop imaging techniques, mostly build microscopes that are so lightweight that can be implanted directly on the brain of the mouse so that the mice can roam about freely, freely and behaving freely while you can record directly synaptic firings from the brain. And that's a large project that we're involved in. It's funded by, uh, uh, from, funded by DARPA. It's a huge collaboration that involves many other universities. The role that we as a computational imaging group play is building microscopes that are uh, flexible, small, and can be uh, uh, implanted directly into the brain of, uh, of the mice. A second project that we are very active in is called Imaging for Personalized Healthcare. To give you some background, uh, you think about the, Think about the 1960s in the US and perhaps in most of the Western world. So how was computing done in the 1960s? Computing was done in the following way. So if you wanted to solve a large computational problem, what you would do is you would actually connect to the nearest university which had a mainframe computer. And this computer was usually associated with a library. You would then book time on this mainframe computer. So you would basically make an appointment. And at the time of your appointment, you had an hour to do computing. You would go there. You would input your piece of code. You would try to run it within that hour. It either if you had no bugs and everything was nice, then you would get your result. If not, you did not. You come back and you make another appointment to try and get uh, get your uh, computation done at a later time. Now, why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because that's precisely how we do healthcare today. Precisely how we do healthcare today. Uh, instead of universities owning all the mainframes, it's hospitals and medical institutions that own every piece of measurement equipment, all MRI, CT scanners, every piece of m equipment that can actually compute stuff about your health is centralized into buildings that are called hospitals. How do we interact with this? We make an appointment. We show up there and there is a 30 minute window when a test of some sort is done. And this episodic result from these tests are used to control care for you. Computing today is not done like that anymore. Computing today is done on personalized computing devices. If you want to do a computation, which is you more or less do, uh, do them on your workstation or even on mobile platforms that you have access to. The democratization of computing has happened, whereas healthcare is still non-democratized. It's still centralized. What we envisage as a view is a world in which uh, computing for healthcare which more or less is measurements for healthcare, is in the tip of your hands. Essentially devices that can be attached, maybe hardware, software applications that can be attached to your smartphone that can continuously and non-invasively measure health outcomes and health, uh, uh, health related uh, measurements. We have several projects in this umbrella. So uh, the most recent uh, outcome that we have is uh, two big uh, outcomes that we have. One, we're able to uh, use nothing but a smartphone camera, just an RGB uh, smartphone uh, traditional camera to measure vital sign parameters such as heart rate, heart rate variability, pulse rate. Uh, and we are currently working towards measuring blood pressure directly from these, uh, uh, from commodity cameras. Similarly, another project where we've had a lot of success is what is shown in this picture here. It's a mobile retinal imager. So it's a small device, a head-mounted device, 
it's very much like a, a, a head mounted virtual reality or augmented reality goggles you wear the device and it can take uh, pictures of the back of your retina uh, diabetic uh, uh, retinal uh, degradations cause especially for diabetic patients are the largest cause of preventable blindness in the world today and so uh, what we are interested in is to prevent this by uh, early diagnosis of diabetic retinopathy another problem that we are very uh, that we've made a lot of progress on is measurement of blood perfusion so amputations especially of the lower limb so basically uh, cutting off your uh, patient's legs the most common cause of amputation is venal diseases that are due to diabetes uh, so diabetic patients do not get sufficient blood flow to the lower extremities and if this continues for ages and ages then eventually the unfortunate outcome is that many patients lose their lower limb to uh, amputations so what we have built is a, a handheld uh, mobile uh, device that can measure blood perfusion the flow of blood in in the veins and arteries in your lower extremities and this can be a quantitative and continuous measure of how much blood circulation is there in your lower extremities such that you can actually uh, do early diagnosis much before these problems become big so that's a large umbrella of projects that we have in this space and i think about right now about half my group is working on projects that have to do with imaging for personalized healthcare uh today in this talk i'm not going to talk about either of these two projects i just put them up here so that if you're interested we can talk about them offline or i can i can point to uh, relevant material most of this talk is going to be focused on extreme imaging and this is basically a catch all phrase so it doesn't really mean anything extreme imaging uh what i mean by extreme imaging is that we're interested in building either very high resolution devices or extremely tiny devices things like that so the focus here is not an application the focus here is just fundamental technology the technology of imaging rather than it serving some particular niche application that we are interested in and the goal of this talk at least my goal for the talk is just to induce excitement just to convey some ideas and encourage you to read the papers for details i'm not going to try to provide all the details in my in my mind the role of a technical paper is to provide all the details and so what i'm going to try to do here is to encourage you to think about the problem and to provide you a flavor of the results and outcomes of our research uh it's not going to provide all the technical details i show yes. we have a little bit of with uh, light from the sun just for everybody on the pc go to our website and then click on the live stream you can see the images a little bit more clearer on the monitors because it's hard on the on the projection screen okay okay on our website you find on the right hand side the link uh, to the talk and then when you click on the click on the link you get the <laughs> website and then you can yeah everybody can do this okay continue sorry No, no problem. I'll wait. I'll give. Uh, I'll give a couple of minutes so that people can get online. Okay. <clears throat> so the first project I'm going to talk about within this umbrella of extreme imaging, I'm going to try and talk about two projects, time permitting. Uh, so I. Um, so uh, the first project I'm going to talk about today is flat cam. thin bare sensor cameras using coded aperture and computation and this project is a joint uh, effort joint is a collaborative work with rich here at rice and ashwin at cmu uh, my postdoc salman asif who is now a faculty at uc riverside and my student uh, ali iram look <clears throat> so if you think about imaging there is this general notion that imaging invariably requires optics and lenses you need a piece of glass to refract light and this refraction of light is what allows you to focus the light from the scene onto the sensor <coughs> we know that this is not necessarily true because the oldest cameras that we probably are aware of the cameras that uh, that uh, people like leonardo da vinci thought about those cameras did not actually have lenses what they had was instead 
a pinhole through which light was enter, allowed to enter into a room. And the back wall of the room captured an inverted image of the scene on the outside, which means that we don't really think that optics and lenses are absolutely essential, but we still think that optics and lenses are essential if we want to get high efficiency or light throughput. The presence of a pinhole usually means that very small fraction of the light enters your sensor. And so if you ever want to increase the light throughput or light efficiency, you want to make sure that you have a lens. Another thing that we've always thought about of cameras is if you think about cameras, one form or the other, the last 500 to 1,000 years, uh, cameras have changed remarkably. But in one way, they haven't changed at all. So if you uh, looked at Leonardo's writings, he talked about camera obscura essentially a room with a hole on one end. Okay. The room had more or less a cube form factor with a pinhole at one end of the room and the back wall of the room serving as your image sensor. Today, the smallest cameras that we are talking about are typically cubes whose sides are maybe five to 10 millimeters, less than a centimeter. So like this bit. That means from the point of view of scaling, we've had uh, cameras that were multiple meters wide, cubes whose sides were multiple meters, down to a millimeter or a few millimeters cube. But the form factor of the camera, that it is in the shape of a cube, has not changed. What's the good thing about it? What's the bad thing about it? The good thing about this miniaturization of cameras is that we get cameras that are really tiny today that operate really well. So you can now integrate cameras into your mobile phones. You can integrate cameras into your head-mounted displays and so on and so forth. What's bad about it? As the size, physical size of these cameras become smaller, so do the sensing surface area. Okay, So that means as the sensing surface area becomes smaller, we allow lower, lesser and lesser photons to be imaged. The total light that we are collection ability has gone down by several orders of magnitude. And so what we would ideally like is large surface area cameras. So let's say you have a tablet or a smartphone. You want the entire surface area of your tablet to be light sensing. Large surface area, but you still want thin devices so that the devices can be carried in your pocket just like you do carry cameras today. So our goal is to decouple this relationship between the surface area of sensing and the thickness of the device. <coughs> what is shown here on the right hand side is an example of our device. This is not just an image sensor. This is actually a full fledged camera. The camera that's uh, what is shown on the left is a US uh, uh, dime. So it's a 10 cent uh, coin. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite small. Uh, the device on the right is both is flat cam, the camera that we have uh, fabricated. It's actually both thinner and smaller than a dime. So in this case, uh, the device thickness is about 500 micron in this particular device that we have shown. So let's see how do we build such thin and flat cameras. Conventional cameras are based upon this idea of focusing light from the scene onto a sensor using a lens. Right. This is what we all know about. What we want to do is to build flat, thin, and light cameras so that they can be used in unconventional applications, uh, maybe as foldable cameras, maybe even flexible cameras, like some of the uh, integrated with flexible sun, sun sensors uh, that some of you guys are working on. Uh, the idea would be that cameras can then become parts of wearables without being rigid devices that are three-dimensional, but rather two-dimensional surfaces that can be easily integrated into all sorts of applications. In a normal imaging system, what happens if you remove a lens? If you remove a lens, light from every point in the scene reaches every point in the sensor, and so the image on the sensor is no longer a photograph. It's instead a complete washed out image of the scene. What we want to do is to design, carefully design a mask that can be attached to the sensor, close enough to the sensor 
such that there is an invertible mapping between the light that's coming out of the scene and the image that's acquired on this mask. What happens is that light that comes out of the scene diffracts due to the small holes in the mask and the diffracted light is then sensed on the sensor. If the diffraction pattern is controlled carefully, the diffraction map pattern can be controlled carefully by choosing correct mask pattern and by appropriately controlling the sensor mask distance. If you now carefully control the diffraction pattern, then the mapping from the scene to the sensor can be made invertible. And therefore, you can invert this mapping to get the image from the captured photograph on the sensor. Okay. As I said, the main goal here in using a mask instead of a lens is that if you use a lens, then the thickness of the device has to at least be the focal length of the lens, which is the reason why mobile uh, and smartphone camera modules are no longer able to make their devices any thinner than they are right now. The currently they've reached a thinness barrier at about four to five millimeters. So none of the cameras that are being made uh, while the thickness of devices have gone significantly from the past to today, they've hit a bottleneck at about four to five millimeters simply because making lenses that are uh, smaller than four to five millimeters focal lens is, is challenging over a wide field of view. What we are interested in is in making really thin cameras uh, shown on the right with a mask instead of a sensor and the mask diffracts the incoming light. The diffracted pattern is now sensed on the uh, image sensor and you use computational algorithms to undo the effect of the mask. Traditional cameras, the ba basic problem is that thickness is large. When you use pinhole yeah, cameras, not only is the thickness large, the light throughput and light efficiency is also very low. We want to uh, leverage upon some of the work that has happened in X-ray and gamma ray imaging where lensless, where lenses don't exist and therefore lensless imaging devices have been developed in the past, but we want to adapt them to use with light-based imaging. Okay. So what's the idea? So as you can see here, we, the idea is that there's a sensor, there's an image sensor array, just like a normal camera. There's a mask in front of the image sensor array. Light from the scene diffracts at the mask and the mask pattern as seen by photo detector one and photo detector two is slightly different, which means that there's different uh, linear uh, combinations of the scene that are being measured at different sensor pixels. What is shown here is on the left hand side is an example of a device, uh, a sensor, a mask, and some scene from which light diffracts and is captured on the sensor. What is shown in this middle here is actually one of our captured images. As you can see, the captured images contain two pieces of information, one that's clearly visible, that is something to do with the diffraction part pattern of the mask, and another which is hidden information, which is the information about the light level and the intensity pattern in the scene. Uh, when you do deconvolution, as is represented here, then you get a reconstructed image, and the reconstructed image is shown on the right-hand side. How does this work? What I'm showing here, what you should see on the right-hand side should be a small video of what happens when a point source is moved in front of the device. As a point source is moved in front of the device, the diffraction pattern of the mask shifts on the image sensor. What that means is that different photo detectors on the sensor acquire inner product of the scene with different translated patterns of the mask. So what do you want the mask patterns to satisfy? You want the mask patterns to satisfy that different uh, shifted versions of the mask are maximally uncorrelated. This problem of finding a 2D pattern, which is maximally uncorrelated when you shift it, has been studied in the communications literature for several decades. And mask patterns that satisfy this property are called M sequence patterns. So in our example, most of the mask patterns that we use are M sequence patterns. In addition, there is another problem with this multiplexing system. So let's imagine that we have now characterized a 
uh, a linear mapping between pixels in the scene and pixels on the sensor. What is the size of this linear mapping? How many pixels do you have in the scene? Let's think about a, a reasonable uh, resolution device. So we're thinking about a megapixel resolution device. So that means the number of pixels in the scene is 1 million. The number of pixels in your sensor is, again, order of 1 million. That means this matrix that uh, captures this mapping between sensor uh, pixels in the scene, pixels to the, uh, from pixels in the scene to pixels on the sensor is a million cross million matrix. That means its size is a million cross million containing 10 power 12 elements. And because this mapping is full, most of these elements are non-zero. That means to do, to understand what this mapping is, you need to store 10 power 12 elements, which is both a challenge from a storage point of view, but an even more challenge from the point of view of inverting a linear system that is 10 power 6 cross 10 power 6, that has uh, the computational bottleneck of solving the system would basically uh, break this problem down. In fact, when we even when we used uh, computationally uh, uh, powerful uh, uh, computers to actually solve this problem, we were stuck at not being able to go to any higher resolution than 128 cross 128 because even at that size, the matrix now has 128 power 4 elements, which is a lot of elements, about 10 power 8 elements. So what do we do? We use a trick, and that trick that we use is called separability. So separability is something that you have uh, you have seen many times before. Uh, so an example of a separability, uh, separable transformation would be something like the Fourier transform. A 2D Fourier transform is separable. It is separable because a 2D Fourier transform, so if I give you an input image and I ask you to compute the 2D Fourier transform, you can take that image, compute a 1D Fourier transform of each row of the image, and then compute a 2D, uh, and then compute another 1D transform of each column of the output. And that would be equivalent to computing the 2D Fourier transform of that image. What's the advantage? Now, the advantage is that instead of having order of n power 4 operations, you now have order of n squared operations, which is a huge reduction in the complexity of computation. So in this case, instead of doing computations that are order 10 power 12, you do all, uh, operations that are order 10 power 6. All right? So that's the huge advantage of using uh, separability. That means instead of um, instead of modeling a multiplexing matrix that is 10 power 6 cross 10 power 6 you only uh, model two multiplexing matrices the ones that are shown on the left and right here that are both about 1000 cross 1000 is this idea of separability clear yes, yes. okay so the the basic idea of separability is that I want to apply a 2D transformation on an image, but if the transformation is separable, then I can apply it in two steps. The first step would be a 1D transformation on every row of the image. Then take the result and apply another 1D transformation on every column of the image. If the entire transformation is separable, then this process is not just an approximation, but it's exact. So now the challenge becomes, can you design masks that ensure that the mapping between the scene and the sensor is separable? What we've shown is that if you choose the mask 2D pattern to be a separable pattern, then even after diffraction, the diffracted relationship between the scene light, uh, light coming in and the sensor measurements happens to be separable. And therefore, and therefore, you can. Uh, I suddenly started getting feedback. Hello. Okay, good. So, uh, so the uh, uh, pattern is separable, and so you can use separability to computationally move this. This makes a huge difference because now, currently, we actually do. Uh, reconstructions of megapixel images real time at about 30 frames per second on a Raspberry Pi. Essentially, you take a problem that was earlier uh, so hard to compute that we basically gave up 
uh, even on a on a high end gpu to do anything greater than 128 cross 128 resolution we are now at the point where we do megapixel resolution reconstructions real time at 30 frames per second on a raspberry pi so here's an example of a prototype that we have fabricated on the right hand side is an example of the prototype it's a traditional cmos sensor on which the mask is already fabricated the thickness is about uh, 500 micron the entire device thickness is about 500 uh, micron and <clears throat> Here's an example of some uh, captured images. On the second row are examples of captured images. As you can clearly see, the images contain both information about the mask pattern and also about the scene. Here are example reconstructed images. These are some of the first experimental data that we got out of our device uh, about a year ago. Here's some examples of real uh, live captured movies with, that we have taken at about 30. I think these movies are actually at about 10 frames per second. Uh, as you can see, uh, the resolution is still uh, of the first device that we built is still low resolution. Uh, the true resolution of this device, even though the uh, reconstructions were probably done at uh, 256 plus 256 resolution, the true resolution of this particular device is maybe about 100 and, uh, 128 cross 128 in spatial resolution. Our current prototypes produce about a megapixel spatial resolution and uh, on a, a four megapixel uh, sensor that we are currently using. And again, our current device is about 400 micron uh, total thickness. Okay. With that, maybe I will stop and uh, see whether you have any questions about this project before I move on to the next uh, next half of my talk. Um, I, I have a question about the, the distance of the mask to the sensor. Yes. So in your in your I think in the flat cam paper you mentioned that it's it's 500 microns I guess uh, because of the um, coating of the, the uh, glass coating of the sensor. Uh, and now you mentioned that you uh, put the mask directly on the sensor, but I think uh, you, you have to have a certain distance uh, between the sensor and the mask because, I mean, clearly if you, if you put it to, uh, on top, directly on top of it with, with zero distance, you cannot uh, take an image. Um, so, so, so how, how so close the, you can get? So the distance between the mask and the sensor is how close you can get. So let's forget about fabrication difficulties. So the original reason why we had a 500 micron thickness uh, distance between the mask and the sensor was because we were not experts in fabrication and we had, and, and so we were actually um, at that point uh, in our first prototype, it was not the optimal solution. It was just what we could fabricate. So uh, now we are no longer in that regime. Now we can uh, be actually working with Jacob Robinson's lab and so we can fabricate what we need. So we no longer need to uh, think about that. But now we need to think about what you mentioned, which is the distance between the mask and the sensor. Uh, you want to get as close as possible because the closer you get, the thinner your device is. But you don't want to be flush on the sensor because you don't get any multiplexing if you get flush on the sensor. The thickness, between, the thickness of the device or the distance between the mask and the sensor is directly a function of about three different things. The first thing is the... Um, uh, is the CRA or the acceptance angle of the sensor pixels. So whether this would basically mean whether the sensor is a backside illuminated sensor or a frontside illuminated sensor. Meaning if you look at a, every pixel on the sensor, the sensor pixel does not, uh, does not accept photons from the entire 180 degrees, but rather it may accept photons only from a small angle. The angle would depend upon the depth of the well in the sensor and on whether it's uh, and on the technology itself, whether it's frontside illuminated or backside illuminated. So that's one parameter. So the larger the CRA of the sensor, the thinner you can make your device. The second thing that matters is the pixel size itself. Okay? As the sm pixel size on the sensor becomes smaller and smaller, the, uh, you can proportionally reduce the thickness of the device. Because what you want to ensure is that the diffracted uh, light, so the diffraction pattern of the mask on the sensor covers 10 to 20 pixels wide. So large enough that there is a large distribution of energy. So 
if the sensor pixels become smaller, then you can make the mask thinner. The thinnest device we have made is about uh, 100 microns thick. So the distance between the sensor pixels and the, the, um, the uh, mask is about 100 micron with uh, two uh, 1.4 micron pixel sizes uh, bin the two cross two. So in effect, they act as though they are 2.8 micron pixel sizes and we can operate with uh, uh, about 100 micron thickness. Uh, in, for all practical purposes, I think the, uh, with modern sensor technology, we are going to be limited to thicknesses of the order of 60 to 200 micron. I think that's the, uh, by modern sensor technology, I'm thinking about pixels that are one micron to about three micron in pixel size, pixel pitch. And CRA, that's currently the industry standard in CRA of these sensors is somewhere between 24 to 70 degrees. With those constraints, we're going to be, the optimal devices will all be some things that have thickness between 60 to about 200 micron. Okay. Uh, another question, uh, how, how is the image resolution um, related to the, to the sensor resolution? It is related to the sensor resolution also. So there are two, th it, but it's not related only to the sensor resolution. The sensor resolution, the number of pixels on the sensor uh, puts an upper bound on the on the resolution. Meaning, let's say I use a one megapixel sensor, that means I cannot resolve more than a one megapixel image. It doesn't mean I will be able to resolve a one megapixel image. Uh, the other things that uh, uh, that uh, affect uh, the reconstructed resolution is the diffracted uh, the diffracted light pattern and also the signal to noise ratio, because the stability of inversion depends upon the signal to noise ratio. So in our current, uh, the most uh, recent prototype that we have built, we use a four megapixel sensor and we get one megapixel images out of them at reasonable, at very high quality and uh, light efficiency. So even though we use a four megapixel sensor, we're able to only get robust about one megapixel images. Okay, thank you. With that, maybe I will move on to the second part of the talk. And in the second part of the talk, I'm going to, so I'm assuming from my clock here, I'm assuming I have about 20 minutes. Is that correct? Yeah. OK, good. So in the second half of the talk, I'm going to try to uh, skip much details. And just uh, in maybe 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about a project that we've been doing over the last uh, two years or so on long range, high resolution imaging through Fourier tachography. This is joint work with Oliver Crossart at Northwestern University. What's the problem we are interested in solving? The problem that we are interested in solving is imaging at long distances. So you want to, you have an object, a subject that's maybe a kilometer away, and you want to take a picture of the subject. Now, in such an imaging context, there are several things that affect spatial resolution. Many of the things on the left hand side are things that we are familiar with, things like finite pixel size, number of pixels that are there noise, motion blur, uh, defocus blur, and so on and so forth. But specifically in this context of long range imaging, there are two things that affect fundamentally the spatial resolution that you can get. And those two things are atmospheric turbulence. When you are looking at long distances, you may be able to uh, build the best imaging device possible, but if there is atmospheric turbulence, that causes uh, aberrations in your captured image and that limits resolution. The other thing is diffraction blur, diffraction blur at the input aperture of your imaging device. And in this project, we are interested in solving the problem of image resolution limited by diffraction blur. So what's diffraction blur? When light enters into any aperture, okay? And in this case, we are thinking about the aperture that's caused by the finite size of your lens. Your lens has a finite size. When light enters into the lens, just because it has a finite size, light diffracts at the edge of the aperture instead of focusing to a point. The amount of this diffraction blur can be represented by an airy disk, and the size of this airy disk is given by this formula. What's, don't focus too much on the formula. The only thing that I want you to look at in the formula is that the radius of this airy disk or the size of the blur is directly proportional to the distance d. So the farther an object is, 
the larger this diffraction blur is. Second, it's inversely proportional to A, which is the aperture diameter. So the larger your lens is, the smaller this, this blur is. Okay. And this is a fundamental uh, limitation, meaning no amount of uh, lens engineering, the best lens in the universe. In fact, this is the characteristic for an ideal thin lens, which means even if you magically built an ideal thin lens that has no aberrations, that has no other uh, practical issues, you would still be left with this blur on the image plane. Now, we've seen the blur, let's convert it into some real numbers as an example for us to think about. So most of the cameras that we are uh, using today, they have apertures of the order of about 50 millimeters. So what I have done here is the calculation for a nominal aperture diameter of about 50 millimeters. Even the really long telephoto lenses that maybe you've seen in sports games and so on, those have aperture diameters that are not much higher than 50 millimeters. At best, they would be like 75 millimeters. So this is a high-end imaging system that I'm talking about. So if you take a high-end imaging system, really expensive imaging system that has an aperture diameter of 50 millimeters, then at about one meter, that corresponds to a 12 micron resolution. On the other hand, at about one kilometer, that corresponds to about a one centimeter resolution. Okay, This means your spatial resolution at a kilometer range becomes one centimeter, no matter how good an imaging instrument you can build. Just in spite of the best cam, the best lens that you can build cannot provide you greater than a one centimeter resolution at a kilometer range. And you can see this as a consequence shown here. What I've drawn here is the x-axis is range. So it's the distance from the target. The y-axis is spatial resolution. Okay. As you go higher on the y-axis, you are able to resolve uh, better and better features. And each of these plots are the best spatial resolution you can achieve by using several different uh, cameras. Obviously, the worst camera I have chose, chosen here is an iPhone 5 camera. That's the blue curve that's uh, shown here. As you can see, it's pretty good as long as you are interested in taking images that are less than a few meters away. So if you want to take pictures of your friends in a party, it's pretty good. But if you want to do anything else, let's say you want to take an image of an object 200 meters away, not too far, just 200 meters away, the spatial resolution that you can get with an iPhone is about 10 power 5 micron. That's basically about one tenth of a meter. That's the best spatial resolution you can get with an iPhone at about 200 meters range. The topmost curve that I've drawn, which is the yellow dotted line, is a custom 1700 millimeter f4 focal length lens that a Saudi prince commissioned Canon to build once. The cost of this lens was about, I think about $6 million. So a Saudi prince pay, paid $6 million to build a single lens that was a 1700 millimeter focal length f4. Okay, so it's not a commodity lens, it's a single custom made lens. It's probably the best lens that's ever been made made by humanity till date. And that lens, even that lens, what you notice here is about at about the 200 meters range, the best resolution you can get is about a millimeter. Okay, so even with this lens, you are not going to be able to get better resolution than a millimeter at about even a 200 meters range. Okay, so that's the challenge we want to solve. So the easy question is, why don't we just build lenses with larger aperture sizes? Wouldn't that solve this problem? Yes. If you could, that would solve the problem. Unfortunately, low and scaling law means that size, weight, and volume of all of these lenses increase dramatically, at least cubically. And in most practical cases, much more than cubically with, with increasing diameter. This is a huge problem, and that's what's plotted on this graph. On the x-axis is... <laughs> on the x-axis is the weight of some of the lenses. We are having problems with receiving you. We have problems with your audio transmission. Can you rejoin the Hangout? Yes, let me uh, disconnect and then connect back in. Yeah, please. Usually it's the source. Yeah.
I don't know what to do with that. Is the audio better now? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So, uh, can you see the screen again? Yes. yes. Okay. On this plot, what I'm showing you on the x-axis is the weight in kilograms, and the y-axis is the cost of some of the lenses that are made that were shown in the previous slide. As you can see, because the increase in weight and cost. On the right hand side is the device that I talked about, which is a custom lens. You can see it's about 200 kilograms. It's really heavy. And it costs more than a million dollars. So it's both extremely heavy and extremely expensive. The goal is, can we do something such that you can reduce both the weight of these devices and at the same time, the cost of these devices? And our goal is to utilize computations to somehow build lenses that are not perfect, but then the imperfections can be undone by using computational algorithms. And in particular, we are hoping that face retrieval algorithms can be used to reconstruct the complete wavefront and therefore obtain high sp higher spatial resolution than would be possible otherwise. <clears throat> so here's our idea. The idea is shown on the bottom here. So you have a scene, it's very far away. Instead of having a single large lens, you want to use a lens array and capture low resolution images. If you use a conventional lens array and take low resolution images in which each of those images now have low spatial resolution and you try to use conventional spatial super resolution algorithms, you will not improve resolution you will not improve resolution because conventional spatial resolution algorithms do not take into account the resolution loss due to diffraction blur. They only take into account the resolution lo loss due to loss of sampling. So if you, were not, if you were in the regime where you are not limited by diffraction blur, but were limited by the number of pixels on your device, then conventional multi-image super resolution may have a place to play. Unfortunately, right in this regime where diffraction blur is the primary uh, limiting uh, resolution limiter, traditional super resolution does not work. And the reason is the face, uh, while the light that's coming in, the light wave front contains both amplitude and face. The image sensor only captures the amplitude and somehow you have to recover the face if you want to get back this high spatial resolution. So to understand that, let's just think about what happens to light. Far field, light uh, Fraunhofer diffraction basically says that far field wave front is basically nothing but a uh, Fourier transform. So imagine light that's coming from a subject that's far away. By the time it reaches the aperture, it's traveled a long distance. And so the far field pattern is just the Fourier transform of the input field that was that you're interested in recovering. What does a camera do? A camera essentially puts a low pass filter on the far field um, Fourier transform. Okay, so a camera has an input aperture. The size of this input aperture decides the size of the low pass filter that you are applying. Okay, so the first thing to know is that far field uh, uh, propagation is a Fourier transform. Then the next thing is that the aperture produces aperture puts a filter, and that low pass filter is what is shown by this uh, notation r omega okay so psi of x y is the is the field that you are interested in estimating psi hat is the fourier transform of the field that is at the aperture plane r omega is the filter that the lens aperture applies on your field now the lens itself computes another Fourier transform and what you get at the sensor plane is nothing but Fourier transform of R omega of psi hat of x y. Okay, psi of x y is the field that you're interested in. Psi hat is the Fourier transform at the aperture plane. R omega is the uh, filter that is applied just because your lens has a finite aperture size. And uh, uh, f is the Fourier transform that the lens applies 
so that's the field. What is shown at the bottom, which is f of r omega of psi hat of x y, is the field at the sensor plane. Unfortunately, the sensor does not capture the entire field. The sensor only captures the squared magnitude. So what you measure at the sensor as intensity is nothing but magnitude square of Fourier transform of r omega of psi hat of x y. Okay, so that's all you get to observe. From this observation, you need to somehow estimate psi of x y. And that's the computational problem that you have to solve. If you can somehow estimate psi of x y from equations of this form, then you can recover high spatial resolution. Okay. Now this has been, people have tried this in uh, microscopy. We have basically adapted these methods from, to move from microscopy to macroscopic imaging applications. So what's the idea? The idea is move the aperture in the Fourier space. Moving the aperture in the Fourier space actually uh, uh, translates to actually just translating the camera. But notice that as I'm moving the aperture in the Fourier space, I'm also making sure that the translate that the overlap that there are overlapping images. That the translation is by a smaller distance than the aperture size itself. So each image then gives me a captured image of the magnitude, but you have multiple magnitude observations that are obtained by, and these magnitudes correspond to different R omegas. Okay, so let's, if we look at this picture, the, uh, the, uh, the location of the camera or the location of the lens determines the pink circle or the R omega choice that I'm showing you. So as I move this camera around in this plane, that corresponds to taking images with different R omegas or different location, different cir pink circles in this uh, image. And each of those, you obtain magnitude measurements at the sensor plane. <clears throat> so here's a, an example of uh, some images that are shown. So here's the central R omega. This is a low pass filter. So the true image is on the left hand side. The right hand side shows you the observed low pass filtered image. As I move this image, so here I'm showing you four different images that correspond to moving the camera to four different locations. As I move the camera to the bottom, you notice that I get edge like responses because what you see is the high frequency information showing as I move the camera to the bottom and to the side. Notice that this is very unlike uh, our own experience when we move a camera. And that's because we are now talking about coherent imaging rather than incoherent imaging. So in all of the experiments that I'm going to talk about, we're talking about coherent fields, which means a laser is used to illuminate the uh, subject coherently rather than using incoherent light, which is why as I move the camera, you now see different high frequency components that come in and go out as shown in the red and the violet boxes here. So what we do is essentially once, so as I told you, the measurements I squared are of the form of Fourier transform of R omega I of C hat, where R omega I, the omega I depends upon the location of the camera itself. We use a traditional face retrieval algorithm. I'm not going to go into the details of the face retrieval algorithm. The only thing that matters here is that we use the uh, multiple images moving the camera to uh, obtain measurements of the form of uh, uh, of the form uh, as shown here, and solving an iterative uh, reconstruction method that estimates both the magnitude and the face of the field at the sensor plane. Uh, so here's shown some, uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip some analysis slides and show you some results. Uh, here's an example of, uh, here's an example of a result where here the top left image basically shows you a captured image with a single camera and the bottom right shows you a reconstructed image that corresponds to about a 12x or 11.8x improvement in spatial resolution. That means in practice, each of those captured images had spatial resolution that was 
about a centimeter in space in space and the re uh, super resolution has given you a 12x improvement in spatial resolution or a 12x improvement in the input diameter of the virtual uh, synthetic aperture that we have created so here's a couple of examples so uh, we're thinking about two examples here a fingerprint at a distance of about 30 meters so we are interested in the application of capturing a subject's fingerprint when the subject is 30 meters away another example we are interested in is doing face rec face rec uh, recognition when the subject is about a kilometer away so here's the first example uh, of a fingerprint about 30 meters away Here's what a normal camera with, a, uh, with the same aperture size would produce an image would look like on the left hand side at 30 meters away. Not sufficient resolution to resolve fingerprints and captured on the right hand side is shown uh, recovered using Fourier tachography. Clearly you can see spatial resolution that's much better and therefore you can resolve fingerprints even at 30 meters distance. Here's a comparison of another imaging technique that can achieve it and that's buying a really, really expensive large aperture lens. And in this case, the competitor lens that's shown on the right hand side is a lens that costs about $150,000. So you could either buy a lens that's $150,000 or you could use your traditional cell phone camera, but move it around to capture multiple images with coherent illumination and then do a face retrieval to get the same uh, high resolution reconstruction. Here's another example, a uh, subject, in this case, the first author of the paper, Jason Holloway, uh, standing about a kilometer uh, from, this, uh, from the camera. Uh, on the left is a traditional camera image, clearly very low resolution, simply because the input aperture was small. Uh, on the right is a recovered uh, Fourier tachography, uh, high resolution image. We built an experiment. Again, just the important thing to notice here is that this would only work with coherent, spatially coherent illumination, which is why in all of our experiments, uh, the illumination source was a helium neon laser that was used to flood illuminate the target. Uh, here's an example of a result where you can see on the top is the low resolution image and on the bottom is the high resolution recovered image on the right hand side. So, We've shown up to about 7 to 8x uh, spatial resolution improvement even in real examples. Here's a real example of a fingerprint. On the left is a captured image with a traditional camera. On the right is the reconstructed both magnitude and face. The right plot on the right is basically the reconstructed face, which basically shows the ridges in the finger. <clears throat> and you can see even at a distance of about a few meters, we can get less than 100 micron spatial resolution on the on 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 targets such as the fingerprint uh, here's another example i'm going to skip this example and maybe uh, at this point stop and uh, take any uh, questions uh, just just before i stop we should note that the main thing uh, uh, is that while this experiment in fourier tachography is a first step towards this uh, operational capabilities of this kind would require us to solve three problems, one of which we have actually solved in the interim period, the difference between transmissive and reflective or rough targets. We've been able to uh, uh, surpass that challenge, but the second and third challenge have to still be satisfied, which is you want to make sure that you're able to do uh, send enough light, uh, coherent light uh, at about 10 to 100 meters distance and the second thing is to is is there any utility in moving these from coherent light sources like lasers to incoherent sources with that maybe i'll stop and take questions thank you very much are there any questions i think there were questions on the left hand project any questions on the second project or on the flat hand project yes do you think that, that replacing the lens in, in this last uh, paper experiment uh, by, by an uh, aperture pattern would have a benefit? Like, I don't know. So we've been thinking about that. We've been thinking about uh, replacing the lens in the second project with a mask and doing, uh, uh, doing a complete reconstruction that's just completely computational. There are some challenges with it, but I believe it can be done. 
uh, if the if the mask in the second project happened to be something that's programmable, which means you can control it over time, then I think it's eminently doable. The challenge becomes if the mask is is a static mask as was used in the uh, in the flat cam uh, project. So we are also thinking about how um, how we can get rid of completely get rid of the lens in the second project because that would. Um, because ideally, let's let's now think about both these projects put together. Ideally, my vision is is the idea of a rollable camera that has a surface area, let's say that's a meter. Okay, so you should be able to go into the field, roll out a camera, and that rolled out camera has a surface area that is a meter. Its advantages in two ways. First, you've got a sensor collection ability that's about a meter. You can collect a lot of light. Second, and maybe even more importantly, the aperture, the diffraction limit is now set by your aperture size, which is a meter long, which means you can imagine doing micron scale imaging from meters away. Ideally, what we would like to do is, is to demonstrate spatial resolution that is microscopy resolution, so sub-micron spatial resolution from several meters away from the target. So I'm maybe 10 meters away from the target, but I can take images that are sub-micron spatial resolution. And you can do that only if you can get apertures that are of the order of meter or several meters large. Thank you. <clears throat> Any more questions? Yeah. How is handled the roughness of the surface and the rising speckle fields currently? I, I could not hear you. Uh, can you repeat that? or? How is handled the roughness of the surface and the rising spectral fields currently due to this coherent illumination? So, so, so uh, the captured images are basically the speckle fields. The speckle field is what contains the information in this case. Uh, so, the captured images, as I showed you, uh, so I, I, I throw an equation at you f, uh, f of r omega of uh, psi hat of xy. That's nothing but the speckle field. Uh, so the the speckle field, the size of the speckle, uh, all the information is contained within the speckle field because the speckle field contains information about the phase of the relative phase between the wave front, and we are actually reconstructing the entire wave front. So uh, the speckle field is the information carrier, and we are actually reconstructing the entire speckle field. Uh, in, in fact, we have now, uh, while this experiment that I showed you here has to do with the uh, with uh, smooth surfaces we have done experiments with rough surfaces so wall my finger things like that where the speckle field is even more predominant and very clearly observable and the speckle field is the information carrier so the speckle field does not pose a problem more questions for the for the last project uh, i should the, i mean the the requirements of using inherent light is a clear limitation for applications. And you mentioned that uh, your future work is to look at incoherent light. But how would you implement this in practice? I mean, if you're interested in um, uh, long distance imaging under uncontrolled environments, even if you have a laser source that is uh, powerful enough, you would still have a mixture of other incoherent light that probably will screw up. The way the way that we deal with other incoherent light right now is actually through spectral filtering. So uh, laser sources, even the laser diodes that we have, uh, car, the idea is that these laser sources are high power and uh, low bandwidth. So you can actually spill, filter uh, most of the ambient power out by uh, on the sensor side, uh, reducing the uh, using a spectral filter that reduces the bandwidth. Uh, the second idea to filter out these sources is much of these high power lasers can also be temporally modulated so that you can uh, you can uh, do coherent coherent in time gating sense uh, to to reduce the effect of ambient um, so so i'm not I'm, so right now i'm so let's also step back and say that uh, this is not yet a practical technique that you can just go out in the field and get images at 100 meters range. This is uh, research in progress, and there are several challenges that have to be solved before this would be a practical technique. Uh, one of those just have to do with 
how do I generate enough light power that's collimated and sent out hundreds of meters away? So I have a target 100 meters away. I now need to send uh, light power to that target uh, and still get enough light back on my sensor. And that itself is a challenge. So there's, there's, there's a few practical challenges to be solved because before it can be used in practice. Um, I, I'm wondering if for the efficiency or the, the, the power problem of the laser, um, the, the problem is still if you filter a particular bandwidth, you still have a mixture of incoherent light when it's reflected from the object, right? Yes. So the, 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 the mixture of the incoherent light would basically cause a contrast problem in the speckle field. Right. This is not. This is not very different from heterodyne detection. So you have a contrast problem, right? So you're. So in holography, let's say you're capturing a hologram. If the if the uh, if let's say the uh, reference beam and the object beam have different intensities, then the hologram would have low contrast. It's the same problem here, which is if the ambient the ambient has very little phase information. Mm -hmm. uh, but the amplitude of the ambient now causes uh, an increase, uh, uniform increase in background. And so the contrast of the speckle field reduces. Uh, the, the more you can filter out the ambient, the less this contrast reduction is. But if you have sufficient contrast, then you should be able to recover the speckle field out of that. OK. Um, any more questions? No. Then, uh, Ashok, thank you very much again for the interesting talk. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you for having me. It was good fun. Yeah, it was fun here too. We might send you more questions by email. Sure, and I'm happy to send you uh, the, the papers that talk about these in detail. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, bye. <laughs> thank you for coming. Next talk will be after the winter break, and we will now go on the website. Thank you.